Hello, wildlings. I'm your creep smith, and you found my fear forge. <laughs> Lucky you. Tonight's tale, I Thought Nothing Could Scare Me, by Joshua Andrew, 1985. I thought nothing could scare me, and then I went to the crow house. I was doing another stint in jail when I first heard about the house. My cellmate told me all about how he wanted to break into it as soon as he got out. That might sound a little weird, but Tommy said he had his reasons, and I didn't care enough to pry. In hindsight, I should have cared a lot more. At Lights Out, Tommy told me so many strange stories about Old Man Crowther and the house that he'd built by hand. I only half listened, as I was focused more on getting to sleep. I used to make Tommy so mad by getting a good night's sleep. He'd say something like, Man, that story about the moving shadows didn't scare you? No, it did not. None of them did. Mainly because I knew they were just stories kids told other kids. Nothing like that was going to be as scary as my first purse snatch or the drug deal I negotiated with the triads or the dozen other times that I'd faced the barrel of a gun. But that fearless attitude tripped me up bad after I got myself out of jail. Tommy showed up one day with another dude who was roughly twice my size, yet Tommy introduced me as the man with no fear. So, of course, I couldn't back down from what I thought was a heist of the crow house. Tommy wasn't leaving anything to chance. He sent me to City Hall. I was going to get the blueprints Crowther had to have submitted when he got the permit to build all those years ago. I zoned out while I drove. I must have because I remember driving and then I was there. <sighs> the receptionist told me that the permits and building department was just two rights and a left down a hallway that she pointed out. Two rights and a left. I repeated it like a mantra and I found the office I needed. Soon enough, I had the blueprints in hand. I looked them over briefly, but I couldn't make heads or tails of it. The crow house was built like a maze. I wasn't worried. I knew how to get around the maze. You just touch a right-hand wall and keep contact with that, and you'll eventually make it out. It's, it's boring and inefficient, but it'll work out in the end. Story of my life. So I left repeating a new mantra, a right and then two lefts, a right and then two lefts. But after that second left, I found myself turning to a bookcase covered dead end. Confused, I went back and then to what I had thought was the first left. After a while, I found myself back at the door to the permits and building department. I opened it for help, but now a new hallway greeted me. It ended with a T intersection, but there was some red graffiti painted on the marble wall. It said, in my own handwriting, don't go left. It just loops around. Then suddenly I jolted awake. I was laying on the ground in front of a T intersection with that same red graffiti. Memories flooded my mind as I re-remembered getting back from City Hall, planning with Tommy, driving up to this cursed house, and entering it. And that was a day ago. Look, I'm sorry for the theatrics, but I needed you to understand what this house does to people. It's not just a confusing layout. It actively tries to mess with you. I thought it was some gas leak disorienting us at first, but the things that I've seen and felt and killed, they couldn't all be figments of my imagination. For a while, we stayed focused and even quickly found Crowther in the living room. 
looking like he'd been dead for several months, just rotting in a chair in front of his television. We prodded his skeletal remains, and their presence actually emboldened us to take our time exploring the nearby rooms. There wasn't much left worth stealing. We knew that coming in, to only expect the money that Tommy was giving us. Regardless of what we found, he'd already paid us 300 each, and he'd pay us another 500 after the job. Apparently, four girls had gone missing when Tommy had lived on this block. He was obsessed with proving that Crowther was behind the disappearances. Obviously, I regret taking it, but it seemed like easy money at the time. We ended up leaving the blueprints in the living room because they seemed to be mistaken at every turn. The, the house just seemed absolutely normal. So, we didn't mind splitting up. I know, I know, dumb move. But the sun was shining bright and we were three dudes convinced that we were the scariest thing in that house. Tommy took this dude, calls himself Thor, and they headed down to the basement since that's where he was most likely to find the remains of a murder sex dungeon. I went straight to the upstairs and quickly searched the bedrooms but found nothing. The upstairs hallway was dark. The attic stairs came down easily enough, but I found no windows up there, which made the darkness stifling. It seemed to swallow the dim beam that came out of my flashlight. Because the light couldn't reach the walls, I felt like I was wandering around in some kind of infinite void. To tell the truth, I kind of liked the feeling. It was otherworldly, and I felt my imagination was inspired for the first time in a long time. But this must have given whatever influenced us an opening. I turned around, expecting to see a softly glowing square showing how I could get down. Instead, I saw nothing but darkness. I panicked for the first time right then, running towards where I thought the door would be, and instead, my body fell through the floor with a tremendous crash. My fall was broken by a bed on the floor below, which wasn't as lucky as it sounds since my ankles painfully smacked the wooden floorboard. I laid there, expecting the house to come alive with angry yells about what a moron I was. Instead, it remained silent, everywhere. After I confirmed that neither ankle was broken, I left the room and found myself in the upstairs hallway, still with the attic stairs pulled down. But now, the hallway seemed twice as long and accommodated twice the rooms. I went straight for the stairs again, but walking down them just led to another hallway full of rooms. I wandered around and opened doors, but only found more hallways behind them. Turning around showed a similar sight of more rooms where the stairs had been. At first, I thought my fall had <laughs> messed me up in the head rather than the ankles. But no matter how far I walked or how much I rested, nothing got better. I didn't understand it. I, I, I didn't need to. I just went into survival mode and forced myself to stay calm. I touched the right-hand wall of the next hallway I entered and walked as fast as my sore ankles would handle. I ignored the flickering lights. I didn't turn to see what was going on with the shadows in the corners of my eyes. I wasn't going to be distracted from my goal of getting out of this place. I called out for help at regular intervals, but I never heard from either of my crew. Instead, I found myself looping back around and out to the first hallway. See, that's the problem with the right-hand trick. It doesn't work if you start out with a disjointed wall. That's when I started tagging the environment with the spray paint that I carried. We had intended on spray painting murderer over the front door as we left, but all of those plans were dead to me now. I thought I made some progress, but this was a large maze, so I ended up eating the few snacks that I'd carried and taking a nap. That nap led to the crazy realistic dream I had. Now, 
Since the graffiti warned against going left, I went right. A right and two lefts. I'd found myself repeating the mantra from my dream. With nothing left to lose, I followed it, and the second left led to a new room. The kitchen. I ran over to the fridge and opened it wide. Yeah, yeah, that, um... Wasn't my brightest move. To be fair, I was starving. I was I, I, I was not thinking of how everything in there would be spoiled if the owner had been dead for half a year. Worse, there was way more meat there than there should have been. Just plate after plate filled with rotting meat. I recoiled from the sight and the smell of it all. But that's when I saw them. Two large pit bulls that had just walked into the kitchen and were already starting to bare their teeth at the sight of me. I still wasn't scared. These were flesh and blood enemies. These were things I could hurt. I thought I'd take that any day over head games. I pulled my revolver out, but the sudden motion caused them to charge. In my haste to react, I fired wide, and then I had both of them on top of me. I fell to the ground and sacrificed my right arm using it to shield my face while I pressed the revolver against the nearest one's ribcage and fired again and again. I saw the pantry door open and Tommy peeked out. I screamed at him to help, but he actually asked, Me? Are, are you talking to me? Even with one of my arms being torn to shreds, I could have strangled him. I put the revolver against the head of the dog that was ripping and tearing the flesh and muscle from me. The, the pain was unimaginable. I fired once, and the bullet entered just behind the eye and exited out the other, grazing my elbow. But the dog didn't stop eating me. I fired again and again. Half of its skull was gone, but the jaws seemed to work just fine regardless. The next time I pulled the trigger, my gun just impotently clicked. I started pistol whipping the dog when Tommy called out, still from the pantry, Are you done yet? Furious, I yelled back at him, It won't die! Help me! Tommy opened the door and walked right up to me, bent down, and asked, What won't die? I stared at him, then looked back to the dog, and it wasn't there. The other dog was no longer weighing me down either. I stood up and examined my mostly uninjured arm. The bullet graze was now the only damage. I started to explain to Tommy, but he shook his head and said, It's the house, man. It's been nothing but insanity since Thor and I entered the basement. Then Tommy started to tell me where Thor was. Well, what was left of him. But I stopped him. I told him that that didn't matter right now, we just needed to focus on getting out of here. He tried to tell me, no, no, you, you don't understand. We found the girls, man. We found them. And as dispassionately as I could, I told him, no, don't tell me what happened because it's only what you think happened. When we get out of here, Thor could be alive, and it could turn out that those girls were never here. Whatever you hear or see or smell, it doesn't matter. I thought those dogs were real, and I wasted all of my rounds. We're going to get through this by being smart and being careful from here on. I didn't tell Tommy that I was only half sure that he himself was real. It wouldn't have helped anything. Either way, I was just happy to have someone else around. We were just as lost, but the company helped. The kitchen door opened to a library with a long, mirrored wall to one side. I ignored it and instructed Tommy to do the same, even though when we'd come in, I thought I saw our reflections doing everything we did, but with the wrong hand. I was steadfast in my desire to not let the house fool me again. I knew the tropes. I'd seen hundreds of horror movies. Maybe this was just gas. Maybe it was ghosts. But I'd figured that whatever was going on 
we could only be hurt by ourselves or each other. Which meant that if I just kept my head down and stepped carefully, we would make it out eventually. And then we reached the dark room. Seemingly randomly. We just opened a closet door and found that eerie black void again. Somehow, I found this comforting since it was one of the first oddities that I've noticed about the house. Maybe, maybe it would be one of the last. But we had to get through it either way. Tommy and I, such tough, strong ex-cons that we were, started to hold hands. It was dark enough that I could never see all of Tommy at one time, and I swept my flashlight over him several times in that dark room just to make sure that it was his hand that I was holding. Then, my light briefly illuminated movement behind Tommy. I didn't explain, I just pulled him along faster, but while I looked behind, something caught Tommy's eye from the front, and he yelled at me to look out. I snapped my head forward and saw that our light was finally reaching a wall. We'd found the end of the attic. I was fully prepared to knock down a wall and drop two or three stories to the ground to get out of here, but Tommy pointed up. My light followed the direction of his finger, but it struggled with the darkness in the air. Still, I could make out that there was something hiding in the corner of the attic the upper corner where the walls met the ceiling, and it was something big. It started to walk down the wall. The details were hard to make out, but I counted eight legs, and that's all I needed to know. I pulled the crowbar out of my bag and started attacking the wall with all my might. I slid the metal in between the wooden planks and pulled them out slowly. Tommy tried to warn me that the spider was coming closer. I looked up, and I could see that it had appeared to grow more. I looked up, and I could see that it had appeared to grow more smaller legs, but it was only a little closer. Shaking my head, I just told Tommy to quit worrying and help me get out of here. He asked me, man, does anything scare you? I just grunted in reply, but really had felt like the house had thrown me a softball. I've never had a problem with spiders. I get not liking something small crawling all over you, but making it a giant spider removed any of the fears that I might have had. And then the next strike against the wall produced a thick stream of sunlight. I tore into it greedily right as the thing above fell down right next to Tommy. I turned around to tell him not to worry that the spider wasn't real, but then all of the words left me. Standing behind us were the four girls. They were all pretty, wearing white nightgowns and seeming to have their heads fused together at the scalp. They were permanently in a crab position with their backs toward the floor and only their feet touching the ground. Their arms flopped around as they moved in sync towards Tommy. All four girls were sobbing. I didn't wait to see what else they would do. I was terrified. I launched myself at that small hole and squeezed myself out of that house like I was the last bit of toothpaste from a tube. After I popped out, a spray of blood followed. Quarts of this stuff. I tumbled on the roof and my vision was disoriented from the rapidly changing direction of my head, the blood in my eyes, and the bright light that seemed to blind me even when my eyes were closed. It didn't matter, I couldn't have stopped myself if I tried. I fell from the roof to the eaves to another lower roof, and then again until I felt like I was falling down a flight of stairs. Until I hit the bottom and realized that I had been falling down a flight of stairs and I was still inside the house. My despair was short-lived since I also realized that I was next to the living room. I crossed to it to get to the front door. I, I only slowed to pause before Mr. Crowther's corpse. I didn't know what he had done or how much of this insanity was because of the house or him or whatever, but 
I still wished that I had bullets in my gun because I would love to have drilled him in between the eyes. That's when his gray, paper-thin eyelids opened and he stared at me with completely white eyes. That scared me pretty good too. I grabbed the nearest thing to me and I ended up breaking his left forearm and shoving the arm bones into his left eye. I pushed in hard, trying to hit Brain. Instead, there was a squeal of pain that sounded like it came from within the head and green blood, for lack of a better word, squirted out behind the ocular fluid. Whether or not that meant that he was truly going to die, I left him writhing in that chair. I needed to get out. It was almost welcoming to burst open the front door and see a sea of red and blue lights. <laughs> I, I found out later that my gunfire had resulted in the neighbors calling 911. I didn't mind. I needed the company. Even as they threw me to the ground and handcuffed me, I, I was happy. At least until I got paranoid about all this just being another hallucination of the house's design. Now, well, there's a lot that scares me. Spiders and things that look like spiders scare me. Going to sleep, waking up, they both scare me. Stairs scare me. But I get to stay locked up where it's nice and mostly safe for a long time. They have no idea how I twisted Thor into the pretzel they found, and they never found Tommy's body, so the death penalty's out. Still, it didn't look too good to have all of Tommy's blood covering me. They keep me in solitary, because I kept splitting my cellmates' heads open to check for little men that might have green blood, just in case. But at least my insanity defense looks to be strong. I'm, I'm hoping that I can get transferred to a more comfortable hospital soon. <laughs> In the meantime, I, I just have to be on the lookout for any logical inconsistencies. The house is not going to trap me again so easily. If I... I'm still in there, I'm going to need to find out as soon as possible in order to escape. No, no, wait, it's not helpful to think like that. I have to remember that I'm safe. Of course I'm out. It's been weeks since I was in that house. I, I think it's been that long anyway. It's just really hard to keep track of time all alone in here. Uh, sorry, I'm not thinking clearly. I can just check the calendar on this laptop. On... Um, the laptop. How did I get a laptop in solitary confinement? Wait. Where am I? Where am I? Where am I? Stay scary, my wildlings, and make the most of your nights.